www.thepodline.com. My name is Patrick Hutzel and I'm your host today for this live stream uh, in our live stream series for families of critically ill patients in intensive care. So in today's live stream we want to talk about my dad has been on fentanyl and propofol in ICU should he be on different sedatives uh, so that he can wake up quicker. That's the topic today and this is a question we get quite frequently uh, from our readers and clients and you know I, I could replace my dad with my mom, my spouse, my brother, my sister, my child, I could replace that very easily with another family relation. So it's a, it's a, a general question I'm trying to answer today. And I have actually deliberately chosen fentanyl and propofol as an example, because that is quite a common thing in ICU that patients end up on fentanyl and propofol. And, um, and then should they be uh, changed to something different? And I will elaborate on that in a minute. Now, before we go into the topic in more depth, I, I just quickly wanna, uh, you know, you might wonder what makes me qualified to talk about this topic. Um, I have worked in intensive care for over 20 years as a critical care nurse. I have done postgraduate studies in intensive care nursing and I have worked as a nurse unit manager for over five years in intensive care um, and I have worked in three different countries and I have been consulting and advocating for families in intensive care all over the world since 2013. Um, I'm also running and operating an organization called Intensive Care at Home, where me and my team are looking after predominantly long-term ventilated patients at home with tracheostomies, but also other clients that would be in intensive care if it wasn't for an intensive care nurse at home 24 hours a day. So let's, write, let's dive right into the topic. Um, please also, as we go along today, please, um, type your questions into the chat pad um, and I can see that Modema is here and Modema if you want to type in your questions please keep them to the top to today's topic and if you have any other questions that are not related to the topic I will get to them once we've um, talked about uh, the topic and then I will get to your questions uh, if you have any others. So. Let's dive right into what happens when a patient gets admitted to intensive care and they get induced into a coma. They end up on a breathing tube, on a ventilator. That is, you know, 99% the reason why people end up in a coma uh, because, you know, if they need mechanical ventilation with a breathing tube in their mouth, in their throat, it's very uncomfortable, you know, um, and they would rip it out. And if they ripped it out, you know, they could die um, and obviously there is a reason why they need to be ventilated. That could be a pneumonia, it could be ARDS, it could be after surgery, it could be brain trauma, it could be chest trauma. There could be a variety of reasons why people are ventilated and I'm not going into too much detail there. What I will say is this, you know, at the moment, a lot of patients are in ICU with COVID, whether it's a COVID pneumonia or a COVID ARDS, and uh, it does make a difference what sedatives are being used, especially when it comes to proning, when COVID patients are proned or any other patient is prone, because then we're often not only talking about sedatives and pain relief, such as morphine or fentanyl. And I should also say that morphine or fentanyl are classified as opiates, right? The classification of the drug is called opiates. Um, and opiates have a highly addictive nature which means if patients are on fentanyl and morphine for too long um, they get addicted and then not only do they need to come off the ventilator as part of the recovery process they often also go through withdrawal from those drugs and that can be a big challenge and also fentanyl and morphine for example have as their main side effect their main side effect is respiratory depression so what that means is on the one hand you need morphine or fentanyl for tube tolerance meaning without morphine or fentanyl a, a patient can't um, 
can't um, tolerate the tube. On the other hand, there are also diminishing chances for someone to get off the ventilator. And I will talk more about that in a moment on how that pans out in practice. So let's just take a what I refer to as a quote unquote straightforward patient in ICU pre-COVID, you know, pre-pandemic patient comes into ICU after open heart surgery, they need to be ventilated for let's just say 12 to 24 hours in order to make sure they're stable, they're not bleeding, you know, and they're on a little bit of fentanyl and a little bit of propofol for tube tolerance. They're not bleeding, they're stable, the blood pressure is stable, they're not going into kidney failure. Then propofol and fentanyl are probably the ideal drug to manage that situation. Why are they the ideal drug? Propofol is short-term acting, meaning when you start propofol as a sedative, it knocks people out straight away. And when you stop it in the ideal world, propofol, a, a patient will wake up pretty quickly. Okay, that's why propofol and fentanyl are very good when it comes to post-surgery. Again, I take open heart surgery as, a, as an example. You know, but you could take any other surgery where a breathing tube and mechanical ventilation is needed. Propofol and fentanyl are ideal. Um, and when you stop fentanyl or minimize, patients also tend to be waking up a little bit quicker compared to morphine. It's just the half-life of the drug is lower. So in a scenario like this, I would say, hey, propofol and fentanyl are great. You stop the propofol, you can very quickly find out is a patient waking up or not, is their brain intact? Good scenario. Now, next, let's just say, let's just say the same patient, instead of open heart surgery, has COVID pneumonia, COVID ARDS coming into ICU. They need to start off with fentanyl and propofol. You know, they're using high doses of, his, of it, and then they need to be paralyzed as well because for example they need to be prone and if they need to be paralyzed that is a whole different ball game because then they need more sedatives and more pain relief such as morphine or fentanyl again they need more opiates why is that when someone is being mechanic uh, when someone is being chemically restrained with a paralyzing agent such as rocuronium becuronium cisatracurium and the list goes on they need to be very deeply sedated because imagine you're on a breathing tube someone is paralyzing you chemically with a drug and you can actually feel things you can you can actually feel you can't move because of the paralyzing agent so you really don't want to go through such an experience you really need to be deeply sedated on top of that you know a lot of patients that end up being prone um, can get incredibly uncomfortable um, and it is very uncomfortable being prone, but it's often necessary to be prone when it comes to COVID, ARDS, COVID pneumonia. Um, it's often necessary. So, but there you also have a problem because if you're being prone or if your loved one is being prone and is on heavy sedatives and heavy paralytics, it will take them longer to wake up and come out of the induced coma right it'll take them a lot longer so we're almost deviating here when someone is prone and using paralytics we're almost deviating from our original question you know i don't want to dive too deep into that and i'm uh, not going down that rabbit hole for now i might do that on a separate a live stream at some point you know um but let's just take you know someone that's in icu again after cardiac surgery, let's just say, you know, you wake them up after, you know, you switch off the propofol, you switch off the fentanyl and you, they're ready for extubation. Then for whatever reason, they need to be resedated. Maybe they're starting to bleed. Maybe they're having arrhythmias, heart arrhythmias. Maybe their blood pressure plummets. Maybe they're going into kidney failure. The bottom line is this, they need to be resedated. Joyce, I just got I just got interrupted. The stream crashed for a moment. I don't know why. I do apologize. I'm back now. So, um, coming back to, um, you know, what if someone can't be woken up, they need to stay under sedation 
for a few more days. Is then propofol and fentanyl still the right thing to um, to take? Yes, Modema, I'm back. I don't know what happened. The stream crashed. I hope you can hear me. So um, it really depends. The answer is that it depends. Okay. If you think you want to sedate someone for a couple of more days, then I think you should stick with propofol and fentanyl because again you can assess a patient much quicker if their brain is intact because one of the first things you need to assess when someone comes out of an induced coma is is their brain intact god forbid one of the worst case scenario worst case scenarios is that someone during an induced coma is having a stroke or seizures and you can't even see it because people are in a coma so therefore propofol and fentanyl are rather good now I've talked about the side effects of fentanyl and morphine, uh, which is again respiratory depression and they're also addictive in nature. Propofol is not addictive in nature. One of the main side effects of propofol, however, is hypotension, also known as low blood pressure. So when someone is being started on propofol, and sometimes they're getting propofol boluses as well on top of that, they often end up with inotropes or vasopressors, which is considered life support because their blood pressure has dropped because of the prop of the use of propofol. So, and you know, that in and of itself is not ideal either. You don't want to have someone on inotropes ideally because that comes with side effects such, such as vasoconstrictions. You're at higher risk of pressure sores. You know, there's a whole lot of other issues coming up. So then the question is, should propofol be changed to another medication? And the answer often is yes. And that alternative medication is often midazolam, also known as Verset. Now, midazolam or Verset is a common sedative being used in ICU, predominantly for long-term sedation. Propofol, predominantly for short-term sedation. Midazolam or Verset, mainly used for long-term sedation because it's a little bit smoother to use. It doesn't have the side effects of dropping the blood pressure quickly, you know, and, and you can use lower doses as well because it's stronger in the onset. Now, what are the side effects of midazolam? Because everything, unfortunately, comes with side effects. Now, unfortunately, midazolam, or Verset, is classified as a benzodiazepine. Other benzodiazepines, for example, are um, temazepam, diazepam, um, Adivan, they're all benzodiazepines, they're all tranquilizers, if you will, they're all set, they all have a sedative effect. Problem with those benzodiazepines is that they are also addictive in nature. And if you have someone on many days, sometimes even many weeks of midazolam or Verset, because it's given intravenously, um, and you wake patients up, then they might need to go through a withdrawal as well and that again is very challenging now when someone comes out of an induced coma they are confused at the best of times so they're often confused they can be agitated you know they can be aggressive even and um and part of that issue is that people are simply going through a withdrawal but even if they're not going through a withdrawal they can still be agitated confused potentially aggressive um so how do you deal with that? You know, it's a vicious cycle that on the one hand, uh, you know, you need the sedatives and the opiates um, to, for someone to be ventilated and tolerate the breathing tube, give the body a rest so that the body can deal with the critical illness. And on the other hand, many of those substances are addictive and, and have respiratory depression as a side effect. It's, you know, after, you know, ICU has been around probably since the early 1960s. You know, it's a shame that no better alternatives have been found. But I, I do come to that in a moment. There is now an alternative that seems to be working in some instances, and I come to that in a moment. Um, the other alternative that has been around on the market probably for the last 15, almost 20 years now, is a medication called Presidex or Dexmedetomidine. So when you look at the combination of propofol and fentanyl for sedatives, you've got the fentanyl on the one hand, which is an opiate for pain relief. You've got the propofol on the other hand, which is for uh, sedation, 
right? And now you've got Presidex or Dexmedetomidine, which apparently is both. It's, pain, it's giving pain relief and is a sedative agent. Now, what can I say about Presidex or Dexmedetomidine? From my experience, it can work in some patients and it's not working with other patients. Is it, is it the better, better sedative to use? I think it is, if it works. But my experience has shown me that it doesn't work in every patient, whereas propofol, fentanyl, morphine, midazolam, slash verset works for pretty much everyone. you just got to choose your preferences and what is appropriate for the individual's situation. Now, coming, sticking with the Presidex just for a moment, uh, Presidex or dexmedetomidine is clonidine-based. Now, why is that important? In the what I got old days when I first started out in ICU in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we were using clonidine in ICU to help patients with withdrawal. So one could argue, because clonidine again has a sedative effect and it also has, uh, it can also be used as a as pain relief. So um, when someone is going through withdrawal and they having clonidine or now Presidex, it smooths out their waking up process very often. And now you could argue using Presidex in the first place eliminates that process. If it works, I'm all for it. But again, I haven't seen it work for too many patients. And then often patients go backwards and they need to use um, the combination of propofol, fentanyl or propofol and morphine or morphine and midazolam slash verset or fentanyl and midazolam. So here is another situation or another, yeah, I'll give you another clinical situation where you need to worry about is fentanyl and propofol the right approach or do you need fentanyl and midazolam? Um, Jose, I've seen your question. I, I want to stick with the topic for now and I'll come to your question to the, uh, at the end. When, I, when I've talked about today's topic and then I will answer your questions that are not around uh, the topic. Uh, but thanks for joining the call. Um, so when someone comes into ICU with a traumatic brain injury, for example, and they're having high intracranial pressures, they're potentially having part of their skull removed, you know, they're having high intracranial pressures, a midline shift, then you probably need to start using fentanyl and midazolam or verset or morphine and midazolam or verset because this is going to be a longer term sedation until ICPs are under control, right? Also, um, you need to then often paralyze patients again. And if they're paralyzed, as I said in the beginning, uh, when patients are paralyzed in ICU, um, you need to go in with the strong guns, if you will, and those strong guns are fentanyl, midazolam slash verset, rather than fentanyl and propofol. Um, the, the problem really is then, how long does it take for someone to wake up? And, you know, the answer to that is A, it depends. B, sometimes the answer is how long is a piece of string? You know, it can take a long time and if you get the sedatives right from the very start and you don't need a prolonged sedation or a prolonged induced coma, um, you know, people should wake up fairly quickly with fentanyl and propofol. But as you've seen now, now that we've sort of looked at different conditions, it's not a one size fits all, unfortunately. It's not a one size fits all. It really is a, is a situation where it very much depends on the individual. Another thing that could happen is, is someone allergic to several drugs? You know, are they allergic to morphine? Are they allergic to propofol? Are they allergic to midazolam? Who knows, right? So that's also coming into play here as well. Um, so let's just quickly look at some questions that we had here now. So we've got um, Jose, you're asking, my dad just had irrever irreversible damage from a stroke on a ventilator. My dad, hang on, just the question has disappeared. My dad just had irreversible damage from a stroke 
in a ventilator. What's next? Jose, that is, I'm very sorry to hear that, but that is also a very general question. And why do I mean it's a general question? Um, a, how do you know it's irreversible? ICUs are very quick in painting doom and gloom pictures. And ICUs are very quick in telling you how negative it all is. How do you know it's irreversible? How do you know the stroke happened while he was on a ventilator, right? So the biggest challenge for families in intensive care is that they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what to look for. They don't know what questions to ask. They don't know their rights. And they don't know how to manage doctors and nurses in intensive care. Now, why do I say all of that? Now, what you're telling me here, Jose, is, okay, your dad had, had irreversible damage from a stroke on a ventilator. Okay, that is only a fraction of what's really happening. If your dad is on a ventilator in intensive care, there are dozens of things happening simultaneously, Jose. Dozens of things happening simultaneously. So it's very concerning what you're telling me here, but I have a thousand questions to what you're telling me and only then can I tell you what's next. Now, if you and I would get on a call with a doctor, you would be surprised of the questions that I would be asking. If you could give me access to the medical records, me and my team would be looking at the medical records and we would probably come back with 25 questions to you. Okay. And we would probably say to you, okay, we need to talk to the doctor and nurse, to the doctors and nurses to find out what else is happening. And just because the neurologist told you, I would take that very seriously. But again, as a clinician, I would have 25 other questions. What else is happening? What does the CT scan show? What does the MRI scan show? What medications is he on? What ventilation settings is he on? Are pupils equal and reactive? What's the Glasgow Coma Scale like? I don't want to overwhelm you here, Jose, but you can see it's not, it's not as simple as what's next. That's, you want to know what's next. But before I can give you that answer, I have a million, million of questions. It's very complex when someone is in ICU. Very complex when someone is in ICU. Jose, do you know if it's a brain bleed or if it's an ischemic stroke or hypoxic stroke? Do you know? While I'm waiting for your answer, you're also saying it's COVID-related, Jose. Okay, fair enough. While well, I'm waiting for your answer, whether the stroke is an ischemic stroke, a hypoxic stroke with a thrombus or a bleeding stroke, I'll answer the next question here from Ariza. If I'm trying to delay the ICU from transferring my loved one to LTAC, is it better to avoid case management social work or to be proactive with them? Again, Ariza, it depends. It really depends. Um, Tell me a little bit more why they are wanting to send your loved one to LTAC. Tell me a little bit more about the um, about your loved one's situation and then I can probably answer your question. How, how long has he been in ICU? How long has your loved one had the tracheostomy for? Have they got a PEC tube? Um, have they got a PEC tube? Are they on inotropes or vasopressors? Are they on dialysis? Again, the list is endless of questions and only once I have a good picture, I can advise you what the next steps are. Okay, Jose, you are saying in the meantime, you don't really know, just told me it's swollen. Yeah, the brain might be swollen, Jose, whether it's an ischemic stroke or a, a, brain st a bleeding stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke. You see, and this is what I mean, the devil is in the detail when someone is in intensive care. You know, whilst you are saying my dad had a stroke and I'm extremely concerned, what's next? I get all of that. I get all of that. If I was the nurse looking after your dad, I would have a million of questions. And I would have the same if you and I were to get on the phone. I would have a million of questions that I would want to ask to the team there, to the doctors. And only then can I guide you with the next steps, really. Um, Oh, Arisa, I didn't realize we have a consultation on Monday. Just if you haven't booked it, I haven't seen the booking yet. But if you, if you uh, want to send a booking through, uh, just go to intensivecarehotline.com 
and there's a, a, a link on the website on the top of the website where it says schedule appointment maybe you scheduled already i haven't checked my calendar in the last two hours or so um but yes you can reserve it for tomorrow Arisa, for sure um so coming back jose to your situation um the devil is in the detail you know i do understand at the moment a lot of patients in icu with covid um uh, end up with strokes for a number of reasons everybody in icu is at higher risk of stroke because they're a at higher risk of a thrombosis or b at a higher risk of um a st bleeding stroke or a bleed in general why is that they're at risk of a thrombus because they're immobile and on the other hand they're getting anticoagulation because they are immobile that puts them at higher risk of uh, a hemorrhagic stroke of a, of a brain bleed um what am i you're saying i wish i found you six months ago sure look it is what it is um you know you know you can't turn back the tide all i can do is answer questions now and, and i think that's what we should be focusing on um so if there are no other questions at the moment i just want to come back to our topic you know what sedatives are best for which situation to get patients out of intensive care quickly as i said from the outset propofol and fentanyl are pretty good if you don't use them for too long if you use them for too long no sedative is good really the goal should always be to get someone out of induced coma as quickly as quickly as possible um what am i you're saying and the virus itself complicates coagulation um look as far as I understand, it can complicate coagulation. Uh, but again, it, it varies on the individual. It's not the primary issue that we see patients having strokes when they're in ICU with COVID. It's not the primary issue. What we do see, though, is patients in ICU in general at a, are at a higher risk of, unfortunately, having a stroke. Mohammed, you're saying my father is in ICU. He's on 55% FiO2 with tracheostomy done nine days ago. He's only on fentanyl and noradrenaline for blood pressure support. However, while intubated and now tracheostomy done, he's stable at 45 to 55% and the doctors can't get him off lower. They have never proned him. Okay, Mohammed, is your dad, Mohammed, is your dad, why is your dad in ICU? Is he in ICU for COVID? Um, why is he there? Share, share a little bit more. If they can't get him lower, the first reason for that is most likely that the blood gases are pretty poor. What that means is when someone is on a ventilator, they are needing blood gases, arterial blood gases. And if someone is on 55% FiO2 and they can't lower that, it means that A, the blood gases are fairly average or poor even, or B, they might not be able to get him any lower because he might be fighting against the ventilator where maybe it's a sedation issue right uh, maybe he's not deeply sedated enough which right ties right back in with our um, original topic that we started off uh, earlier today um, so also if he's on noradrenaline in the ideal world um, they should get him off that noradrenaline as quickly as possible maybe like i said in the beginning maybe he's on too much propofol um or you, you, you know you're not mentioning proper here. apologies but he might be dehydrated he might have an infection that could be one of the reasons why uh, he's needing the um, noradrenaline um but mohammed if you can share with me why your dad is in icu um, and why you think they can't lower his fio2 that would be good because then i can hopefully help you with the next step um while i'm waiting for uh, your answer mohammed uh, more than you're saying your loved one was on ecmo yeah look i've done separate videos about ecmo and i will do other videos about ecmo in the future um again it's not today's topic mohammed you're saying he had covid and now they have said he has pneumonia Showing signs of scarring in the lungs. He's been in ICU for 37 days. I think now we're getting closer to the, to the truth here. Okay. 
So it's been a big issue across the board, unfortunately, that many patients in ICU with COVID end up with scarring of the lungs. And that is definitely an, or can be an obstacle to weaning off the ventilator. And that might be one of the reasons why your dad can't come off the ventilator yet. Um, okay, Mohamed, how old is your dad? And I, I will tell you in a minute why I will why I'm, why I'm asking that question because age can lead to different treatment options. Um, I'll just start to elaborate on that a little bit while I'm waiting for your answer, Mohamed. How old is your dad? Um, so when someone is having scar tissue in the lungs, it's often irreversible. Okay, it obviously depends on the extent, how big is the scarring of the lungs, you know. And then the question is, how old is a patient? Now, if they're scarring and they can't get someone off the ventilator, are they a candidate for ECMO? Um, okay, Mohamed, you're saying he's 65 years of age. He has had four heart bypasses done 10 years ago. Okay, now, Mohamed, your dad is right on the cusp. What do I mean by that? 65 years of age is the cutoff for someone to have ECMO. And it's also the cutoff often for a lung transplant. Now, I'm not going into too much detail today about ECMO. Um, I've done countless of other videos about ECMO and I will do future videos about ECMO. Uh, basically, what ECMO does, it can take over the function of the lungs for a period of time and it can give the lungs time to rest and heal. Now, if there's scar tissue, the doctors might argue scar tissue is irreversible. But what ECMO can do is ECMO can buy time whilst your dad might be waiting for a lung transplant. Right, so that might be an option here. ECMO leading to a lung transplant. There's no guarantee that your dad will get a lung transplant, but ECMO is often a bridge to a lung transplant. Now, what probably stands in your dad, not in your dad, what works against your dad's, dad's situation at the moment is, I believe, he's been in ICU for 37 days. They probably should have offered him ECMO very early on. You know, the, the earlier you get someone on ECMO, if the lungs are failing, the better it is. Um, but I would assume you probably didn't know that there were alternatives for that. Um, and also what they might say is, you know, if he's had four heart bypasses 10 years ago, um, that might rule him out to go on ECMO because of other risk factors. I wouldn't know. Again, you know, there are so many, there are so many details that need to be looked at when someone is in intensive care. Whilst I'm saying he might need ECMO, you know, what else is going on? What, what other pre-medical history does he have? Does that potentially exclude him from ECMO, you know? There are so many variables um, in a situation like that. And bear in mind, at the moment, the demand for ECMO is very high. Why is the demand for ECMO very high? Previously, pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, um, uh, many patients in ICU had ECMO because of ARDS slash lung failure or heart failure. So now ARDS cases have gone through the roof because of COVID. So the demand for ECMO has gone through the roof. Okay, so now it's even more difficult to get ECMO. There's a staffing shortage everywhere, staffing crisis, you know. Um, it's very difficult at the moment to get the right treatment in a timely manner because of COVID, because of staff shortages, because of equipment shortages. But also if someone is on ECMO, staff, doctors, nurses need to have done specialist training to look after a patient on ECMO, right? So it's a whole lot of complicating factors. Now, I am conscious of the time. I usually keep those sessions to about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and I wanna answer as many questions as I can, but I wanna give you the option to ask other questions while I'm still here, but I will wrap this up in about five, five or 10 minutes. Uh, but I, I, I absolutely wanna make sure all your questions are answered while I'm still here. So please type your questions away so I can uh, 
carry on answering them. Just quickly while I'm waiting for your questions to come through, I just quickly want to go back again to um, our initial uh, topic, you know, and maybe combine that also with the question around ECMO. When someone is on ECMO and they have a tracheostomy, they often don't need sedation or they need minimal sedation because the tracheostomy is much more um, comfortable to tolerate compared to a breathing tube, you know. So there could be numerous um, advantages for your dad, Mohammed, if he can end up on ECMO. Um, you know, is your dad awake? That's another question. You know, I don't know if your dad is awake. Um, so in terms of, you know, just coming back to our initial topic, the longer someone is on an induced coma, the more you want to use long-term sedatives such as midazolam rather than propofol because of the side effects, you know, and also you can use lower doses, you know, propofol, sometimes you need to use 200 milligrams an hour and so forth. Mohamed, what are you saying? Uh, if you get a chance, can I pay you to be a consultant for my father and call the ICU just to see if they're giving him every right treatment? The doctors change every two days. Yeah, for sure. Um, you can absolutely reach me. It sounds to me like you are in the UK, Mohamed. Is that because you're talking about ITU? That's a UK uh, specific uh, term. They're very short staffed and don't know the patient properly. I had to fight hard just to get him to do a tracheos, to have a tracheos. Yeah, I can, I can appreciate that. It's very difficult. It's very difficult at the moment. And to me, it looks like you might be in the UK, Mohammed. And um, the UK system is probably the worst system out of all. Uh, yes, you're in the UK. Right. Mohammed, um, either send me an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com. That is support at intensivecarehotline.com. Or you can call me on my UK number, which is 0118. 324-3018. That is again UK 0118-324-3018. But you will also find that number on our website, intensivecarehotline.com. It's right on the top of the website or on our contacts page. So you can you can contact me there. Um right. So look, I really want to wrap this up here if there are no other questions. I do really appreciate you coming on to this call. Um, to this live stream thank you for your support thank you for your questions and um, I will do another live stream in about a week's time at the same time 7 p.m. on a Saturday Eastern Standard Time uh, 6 p.m. Central Time 5 p.m. Mountain Time 4 p.m. Pacific Time that's 11 a.m. on a Sunday Sydney Melbourne and it's unfortunately in the middle of the night in the UK, but the recording will go up later today and then you can watch the replay, of course, and it'll be there for a long time to come. Um, thanks, Modema, for your kind words. I highly recommend that you do, more, Mohammed. Thank you for your kind words, uh, Modema. Um, if you find value in this video, give it a thumbs up, give it a like, subscribe to my YouTube channel for updates, for regular updates for families in intensive care. Send your comments below what you want to do next or what questions you have and uh, click the notification bell. If you have a loved one in intensive care, go to intensivecarehotline.com, call us on one of the numbers on the top of the website or simply send us an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com. Um, thank you, Mohammed, for your uh, kind words. You're great at what you do. Every single person appreciates your content. Thank you. Saving one life is like saving humanity. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your encouragement. Thanks. Thank you for coming on. And I will